Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Chris Sotomayor. He is a color artist. Chris, welcome to Comic Culture. Hi, Terry. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here. So you are a, a color artist, and um, obviously most people are aware that you know the comic books are the four color hero. So I'm wondering what your method is to put colors on page uh, on the page. I mean, I know in the old days it used to be you know maybe some color inks and a color guide, and and it's a lot different now. So if you could tell us a little bit about your process. Yeah. Well, I actually got started in comics as a color guide artist. Uh, so I've run the gamut from you know old school like 80s and 90s coloring to more current modern computer coloring um right now yeah i'm a digital color artist uh work on a mac with photoshop as far as most are concerned that's still pretty much the standard although other software is creeping in um and yeah what i do is uh after i get the artwork from editorial from whatever publisher i'm working with um i try to get a copy of the script i try to talk to the editor the writer the uh, the penciler sometimes uh, actually I the, the penciler most times um, I try to get a feel for what their intent is what kind of story it is and just try to figure out from reading the script how I can help tell the story because the storytelling is the key that's it, that's the main focus as long as the story is clear and, and the intention is clear then everything else just kind of falls into place I think we're familiar with the the pencil art and the inked art uh, looking a certain way and Color art is designed to enhance and maybe add some effects. So it's it's interesting to hear that you are, um, I guess, speaking with the the penciler to make sure that you capture that that feeling and make sure that you sort of enhance his or her vision. So has there been a, a time when you've looked at something and and maybe they were thinking one thing, you were thinking the other, and you, you just kind of had to hash it out based on what you saw? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, whenever I start, like especially a new project, any kind of number one that I work on, uh, I'll do a couple of pages just so that the pen penciler can see where I'm coming from and the writer can see where I'm coming from. Um, and then, you know, we'll go from there. We'll use that as a starting point. And sometimes I'll completely change my approach. Uh, actually, uh, I just finished a new mutants book with Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, and I did a few pages, uh, first, and it was kind of a, a bit of a tighter deadline than, than usual. Um, especially for the size of the book it was. Uh, and I did a few pages, sent them along to Bill and Chris, uh, and Bill right away, right away, he gave me some feedback and I kind of rethought my whole process. And what we wound up with was, I think a hundred times better than what I started out with. So yeah, that, that happens. And I'm totally prepared for that. There's a, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a soldier, you know, there's no ego. Uh, I get the thing. You, you tell me what the thing has to be, and I do the thing. You, you mentioned Chris Claremont, Bill Sienkiewicz, and they are, I mean, legends in, in the field. So uh, I know if I were assigned a book like that, I might have, a, you know, some nerves dealing with, with those two creators. So I'm wondering, when you get something, I mean, you're, you're a fan of comics, obviously, or else you wouldn't do it for a living. Uh, when you get work from people that maybe you grew up reading, how do you uh, kind of say, okay, now I'm, I'm, good, I'm, I'm up to this challenge? I've been doing this for a couple of decades. Uh, I have to act like I've been in the end zone before, <laughs> you know, so as long as I don't embarrass myself or start gushing like a fanboy, I think I'm OK. Um, Bill is a special case because he's one of my favorite artists. Uh, another one of my favorite artists is Dennis Cowan. And I just happen to be working with them on the new question series for uh, DC's Black Label. Um, so again, I had to kind of rein it in because I've known Dennis for a very long time and he actually had a hand in me becoming a professional comic artist. Um, and Bill, I just, I've loved him forever. And, uh, you know, since Moon Knight and them together, you know, I remember that from Dr. Zero and that was pure magic. Um, so I've, I've admired a lot of the, the people I've wound up working with. Um, Alan Davis, who I'm working a couple of issues with on uh, Conan. Uh, Savage Sword of Conan, uh, you know, Bill, Dennis, you know, if anybody. I, I'm I'm a fan of comics. You know, I, I grew up with comics and uh, it meant comics meant a lot to me growing up. So, yeah, it's uh, I just got to steal myself and, you know, plow ahead. Uh, I spoke to uh, Tom Orzakowski once and he said 
some of his earliest assignments were, you know, Jack Kirby and, and, uh, and you know, maybe Steve Ditko or someone like that. And he said just actually seeing those penciled pages before they were inked was, was worth all the, the effort that he would put into that book. Uh, yeah. And it's, just, it's great to see that there's still that, that, um, that connection, that love, uh, even though, as you say, you've been in the industry for a few decades, which leads me to the, the fact that over the decades, uh, coloring in comics has changed, I guess, going back to the 90s when Image started um, making colors a lot more important to the story. Not that they ever were unimportant, but when you get a book like New Mutants, which was you know, in the 80s with that simpler color style, and you take a story that I would imagine with that same creative team, maybe they want to be reminiscent of that style, but at the same time, it's you know, 2019. How do you sort of come up with that, uh, that approach? I mean, you, just, you mentioned that you spoke to the artist to make sure that you matched his, his feeling, but how do you kind of balance that uh, aesthetic when you're sitting at the tablet? What we did with that book in particular was, uh, like I said, I, I had a different approach. I went highly rendered and I tried to keep everything loose and energetic like Bill's artwork is. Um, but when we started hashing it out, what Bill told me was that he wanted it to still seem, you know, like a dream. He said it was more like a dream sequence. So there were a lot of like murky things and, and, uh, he didn't want everything to be overly rendered. He wanted everything to just kind of live in, in an environment, in, a, in an atmosphere. So that was just those few words, that description right there helped me immensely to kind of figure out where I wanted to go with it. Um, so what I wound up doing was a less rendered style, which was less intensive as far as uh, time spent on each page. You know, I didn't have to noodle every little thing. Um, but what I did was more broad stroke stuff, and I went for a, a, a simpler but more watercolored look. So that was an excellent case of a book being, you know, a little retro, but being way modern at the same time. Um, and and I, I have to say, you know, I think it's funny. Um, comics coloring has gone from very flat, simple um, and then there were uh, a few painted books, like Blue Line books, like Electra Lives Again and Dark Knight Returns, Green Arrow, Longbow Hunters. Those were painted books. And then we went into computer coloring, which had a very slick kind of feel to it, uh, very edgy and, you know, lots of blue and orange and purple and yellow and red and green and red and blue. And now we've come back to kind of making the computer colors mimic some more traditional techniques. So I, I find that uh, hilarious <laughs> in a lot of ways that it's come so full circle. When you take a look at the, the pencil and ink art, uh, a lot of times you, you have, a, uh, I guess, two approaches. You have some artists who are very realistic in their approach um, and every page looks like every single detail has been added by the, the penciler and the inker. Uh, and then you have some artists who seem to maybe go more with uh, a looser line and less, uh, less uh, spotted blacks or something like that. So when you get right. art that's on either end of that spectrum, how do you approach it and put the right amount of, of image into that, or not image, I guess, the company, but aesthetic into that so that you, know, you match the pencils that are over-rendered and the pa pencils that are leaving more room for you to do something? You know, it really depends on what the book needs, the context of the book. Uh, like, I, I'm, I was fortunate enough to work with Rick Leonardi and Andy Parks on uh, Batman Beyond. And Rick's style is, you know, it's a little loose, high energy. I, I love those high energy styles. Um, but there were things in there that left a lot of room for me to uh, go in and add a little extra. Uh, you know, power effects and spotlights and cityscapes that I could paint in. Whereas something like that, you take a look at it and go, uh, you know, that's a style that could go for a simpler look. I kind of went in the opposite direction because, I mean, it's Batman Beyond, so there has to be a certain level of tech and, you know, glowing things and designy elements. And some of that was better uh, rendered or, or better, maybe a little more complex or sophisticated than a simpler style would have been on it. Um, so that... You know, that was another case where I worked with the editor and the writer, Dan Jurgens, um, and Rob Levin. And we figured out an approach that would work within the context of the book and still play off of uh, Rick's strengths. So, I mean, it's all – one of the things I love about comics is how collaborative it is. 
You know, it's a bunch of guys who love comics or, or a bunch of folks who love comics. And we're all trying to tell a great story. And we're all trying to get the best work out of each other. And, you know, you'll have something like, like Batman Beyond. I told the editor that that was a really great experience for me, professionally speaking, uh, because the editor got a lot of, of really good material out of me, I felt. Um, and the same thing with the New Mutants book, you know, working with Bill. It's Bill Sienkiewicz, so how can he not elevate you, you know, even with, with some simple notes? So the the, collaborate, the collaborative part is really one of the aspects that really appeals to me because I think it's – it's so unique and it's so it's so important. It's not like film where you know there's a lot of moving parts. Um, comics is a little more intimate in in that collaboration because it's only a few people in there, just trying to to point the ship in the same direction. And you you mentioned uh, Dan Jurgens, Rick Leonardi. Uh, you're mentioning people who have had long careers in comics, and you've had quite a career in comics. So. That tells me that you've learned a few things over the years in order to hit deadlines and, and get the product the right way for uh, the editors to not only want you back because you hit the deadline, but because you did a great job. So um, how did you sort of come up with that, that professionalism to make sure that you, you got everything done when you needed to get it done and made it look the way it should look? <laughs> Terrence, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but... Uh... I would say a lot of it comes down – when I first got into comics, you know, working professionally, I was, I was a lot younger than I am now. Um, you know, I was, I was really young, and a lot of it was uh, fear, <laughs> i got to say. Um, you want to do right by the editor. You want to do right by everyone involved in a book, and you want to be called back, and you want to be thought of for the next thing. Um, and just like any other business and, and entertainment – Everyone always looks at the last thing you did. So if my last thing was good, you know, hopefully I'll be called back for the next thing. And the next thing will hopefully be bigger and better. Um, so a lot of it had to do with fear and uh, wanting to please, which is maybe, you know, my neuroses. Um, but some of it, I think, is I, I really try to be easy to work with. It's it's really hard to upset me, number one. Um, number two, I... I tend to have a lot of empathy towards uh, my collaborators uh, and, and, uh, and editors, especially because I know what the editorial job is. I, I actually started out as an editor for a couple of years. Um, so I got a taste of what that part of the job was. And I understand the deadlines that uh, artists go through um, and, and the deadlines that writers go through and how many rewrites they go through. And uh, with artists, how many times they're asked to redraw stuff because maybe a layout didn't work or an inker who has to, you know, do a patch for a page because maybe a costume was wrong or a texture was wrong or they they read the line work wrong and, you know, they got to redo stuff. So I know we're all just trying to just have each other's back. So I try to be an ally. You know, I try to make sure that if the pencil is running late, I let them know, hey, I'm only up to this page. You go ahead, you take as whatever you need, as long as I stay right behind you and you just let me know how much time you need, I'll let you know where I'm at and then we'll meet in the middle and we'll, everyone will be happy. You know, and if I know it's an issue with uh, a penciler or an inker, if the inker hasn't said anything to the editor, I'll let the editor know, hey, you know, we're, uh, we're collaborating, we're working together, we're coordinating to get these pages done. So you don't have to worry. Trust me, this stuff will get done. And I think that has really helped my reputation in this business because I like to think that editors and, and uh, other artists and writers know that if I'm on a book, number one, it's not going to miss a deadline. Uh, it will always ship on time, no matter what. Um, I put the time in. And number two, I'm there if there's a note. Like I said, I'm a soldier, so I'll do the thing. You tell me the thing that needs to be done, and I'll do the thing. Whether it's a note I agree with or not, I'll figure out a way to make it work. Because a lot of times, notes I get from editors or artists, uh, some of them are not really reacting to the thing they think they're reacting to. So I can change other things so that the thing they're reacting to works uh, in the way they want it to work, even though I didn't change that thing. It's, it's a context thing. And you said you, you find a way to get the, the work done. So I'm assuming that this is not necessarily 
a nine to five job or a two to 10 job. You are maybe sometimes putting in those all nighters. And I know for me, if I've got a project that I've got to get done, I'll get it done, but gosh, the next day I'm, I'm kicking myself. So I'm wondering if, if this is something that you've managed to work out or if you're still you know, just down in a, a Red Bull and, and going to work. For a very long stretch of my early career, I subsisted on coffee and Rice Krispie treats. And I gotta tell you, <laughs> that is not good for your health. Um, I stopped doing all-nighters about 10 years ago, maybe 12 even. Um, I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, after a while, you know, you get older and your body changes and you don't have the stamina you used to have. So what I used to do is I, for a while I was just getting up extra early. House is nice and quiet. My office is nice and quiet. I can get a few pages done before I have to get the kids to school or what have you. I would rearrange my schedule a little bit on the front end. Um, nowadays I, I mean, like I said, I've been doing this for a while, so I've got, things I can tweak in my workflow that can make pages go faster or, or projects go faster. Um, you know, little tips and tricks here and there. And also I make sure that I break up my work day. I, I do a series of sprints instead of a long marathon. Uh, cause I don't want to get tired at the end. I want the last page to look as good as the first. Um, so I'll do the, the big chunk of my day will be, you know, nine to five or, or 10 to five. Uh, then I'll go do something else. Uh, I, I train in martial arts. Uh, you know, sometimes the kids need to go and, and they have things that need to be done. So I'll take them to that. Um, and then after all that's done and I've made dinner and I've had dinner and, you know, the kids are to bed or, or what have you, where things have just slowed down a little bit, then I'll go back to the office for a couple more hours. Uh, usually no more than three and I'm in bed by about midnight, one o'clock. Uh, but at the end of the day, I've done, you know, maybe 10 hours, which isn't so bad. Uh, I've learned to get more pages done in a smaller amount of time. But I prefer to take my time and be able to put the work into, you know, three or four pages a day instead of doing like eight to 12 pages a day for a deadline that's really tight. And you mentioned that you had some shortcuts that you would, uh, I guess, stumbled upon or decided had worked best for you. So is that something that maybe it's a, a, an approach to a background or a way to do, uh, you mentioned some high tech effects in Batman Beyond, something like that, you've got that bag of tricks that you can apply sort of generically to a project and then tweak it to something specific for that project? Absolutely, if I know, like on Batman Beyond, um, and I actually did a YouTube video on, on my channel for that, uh, there's, because there's so much you know, high tech background work um, a lot of cityscapes. What I did was I created a grid, just a very simple grayscale grid that's just black and black and white. Um, it's all black line with with white squares. And what I do is for those cityscapes, I take pieces of that grid and I paste it into the line art on another channel, and I'll kind of warp it so that it looks like window panes. And then I'll select some random spaces inside the grid. And then I'll just throw in a color and then all the windows are done. So things like that. Sometimes I have uh, different kinds of backgrounds that I use. Um, I have a, a colored file that's just like all these random dots that are like really close together. Um, it, it looks like a, like a Chuck Close painting almost, uh, you know, but it's a big mess. But I know if I take that and I t paste it into a crowd scene and then fiddle around with it, tweak some of the colors, make it all look, you know, like, like it belongs in the space. Uh, and then I'll add a couple of random marks on top. It looks like a crowd scene and I can be done with a crowd scene in like a couple of minutes. So little things like that here and there and some custom brushes. Um, if I think something's going to run late consistently, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use some custom brushes that I know will do like double duty on some things or uh, that I know will give me a desired effect that I could use throughout a whole project. And when you are working on a, a sequential page, um, when you are getting the, the, the characters and let's say it's, uh, you know, um, Batman from Batman Beyond, he's got a certain costume, but you're also going in there and you're putting in uh, different shading and texturing and, and that sort of stuff. So when you're actually doing the, the coloring of a, a character, is this something where it's, it's just one layer and you're putting it all together or are you compositing a, a number of layers together uh, and then you can turn one on or off and see how you like that? 
Actually, I work on one layer. I always color on my, my one single background layer. If there are any effects or anything, I'll put those on other layers uh, or textures I'll put on another layer. Um, but basically, it's I, I went to art school, so I learned to paint with oils and acrylics and stuff and watercolors. So, you know, you go to art school and you only have like the one board or the one canvas. So I just learned to do it like that. And that's the approach that I mimic in computer coloring, just as if I were painting. I've, I've spoken to a couple of colorists and they're talking about how, oh, I've got my flat layer. And then on top of that, I put my highlights and then I put my... So you're working as if it's just uh, the board in front of you. That's, that's fascinating. Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, this is what I was used to. This is what the, my painting teacher drilled into my head. So it's just what I've always done. You mentioned before we started taping that um, you have uh, some, I guess, uh, action figures on the wall that are actually pieces that you contributed uh, to the, the product art. So I'm wondering, when you're working on something like that or you're working on the cover, uh, do you approach that differently than you would uh, the, the colors on a sequential page? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, sequential pages, since you're telling a story, you have to worry about uh, mood and lighting consistency and uh, you know, direction and, and uh, how things behave in certain spaces and, and lighting. Um, for stuff like covers, my main focus is to make sure that one cover doesn't look like the, the, the same cover from the month before or two months before. So I like to see what that last cover was or two covers ago were. Um, and then I just make sure that it's just a very different color design. Uh, like when I worked on Nightwing, I was fortunate enough to do all the covers or all the regular covers, not the variant covers, but all the regular covers, they all had different color designs. So if a book is racked one or two months previous, one or two months back with the current issue, then fans don't get confused. Readers don't get confused. They don't know. They don't say, oh, did I get this one already? It looks like the other one. Because I know I've had experiences like that when I was buying certain books that had very similar covers. I wouldn't know if I had that issue and I'd wind up, you know, buying two or three copies of the same book. It gets so frustrating. Um, with stuff like the, the toy stuff behind me, that all has to have a very specific and distinct look and consistent look because it's packaging art. So I keep everything very local, very straightforward, um, make sure it's just all lit, you know, very similarly because it all has to sit together on the racks on, on, the, on those uh, those pegs. So uh, that has a very specific look. Um, and I just, I, I deal with that as a whole, you know, and uh, on those back there, I worked with Ed McGinnis on those. Uh, and he brought me into that job and we kind of worked on that stuff together. I'm imagining for uh, a store display, the, the character has to be in a certain spot because there'll be the figure in the package and then there'll be the bubble and everything else. So uh, is, is that something that you, you're considering? Yeah, when uh, when I worked on that stuff and when my studio worked on a bunch of licensing images for, for uh, Marvel characters, um, we had very specific parameters. Uh, all the characters had to have like daytime lighting and uh, local colors and you could only use a certain like certain reds for certain things and certain blues for certain things and they all had to be consistent. So we made sure that where I made sure that all of Iron Man reds were consistent throughout, you know, all the, the, the images and his golds were consistent. They were handled the same way. Um, and then for uh, whoever's drawing them, there are certain parameters as far as size and, and how much space it actually takes up on, on the, the card back. Um, so that's something that needs to be considered. And for me also what background they're going to use, if they're going to use a background that has a lot of light in it, then, you know, maybe I want to, not add like some rim light on the side because then it could all bleed together. You know, so I'll use single light source uh, techniques and stuff like that. Yeah, they're, they're, everything is kind of its own different animal and needs its own kind of attention. So I try to keep that stuff in mind. And, you know, having done so many different things like that, it, it gives me the opportunity to, to really uh, be, well, again, like an ally to the rest of the team because I know what that entails and I know what this needs to be at the end. So it, it just means less editing later on, less feedback, less notes, uh, you know, fewer uh, back and forth sessions, you know, things like that. And, and just being easy to work with like that, I think is part of the thing that 
helps my longevity. Now, Chris, they're telling me we have about a minute, a minute and a half left before we have to wrap up our conversation. So I was wondering if you could tell me uh, a project that you've worked on that uh, we should look into because you think it's, it's perhaps your best work. Oh, uh, you know, I'm no really pressure. hard on myself. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, have, I, I suffer from imposter syndrome a lot. Um, but I have to say I'm probably right now the most proud of that New Mutants War Child book with uh, Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz. I, I think right now that's, that's the thing, at least until the question comes out. And then I think that'll be the thing. Chris, I'm sorry we've run out of time. I'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and talking with me today. I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.